from what I understand, like a long-term business development and professional services, it can take like a year for any of these things to bear any fruit. And I think that's even a little thumb in the air. It could be two years, it could be five years, it could be whatever. It's really about just staying top of mind. Like it's repetition, right? How does trust get built? Repetition, credibility. Welcome to the Small Business Mentor Podcast, where we shine a light on the black holes of business growth with your host, Alan Pence. In each episode, we explore the leaps and bounds entrepreneurs make as they push their businesses beyond the 1 million mark into the realm of professional sustainable growth. Stay with us as we navigate the journey from brute force to finesse. Today on the Small Business Mentor, we have Dylan Chatterjee of On Bench Consulting. And uh, Dylan and I met, I guess, originally through a newsletter I was writing. We started corresponding and then a little bit on X. And then we met up in person at Brent Beshore Permanent Equities Main Street Summit and got to spend some time together. So it was great. And uh, I thought he'd be a perfect guest for early on and the Small Business Mentor podcast life. So welcome to the pod, Dylan. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. So first, what is OnBench and what do you guys do? So OnBench is a software services company. Our two main books of business are technical team augmentation and managed services. So our team augmentation is software engineering, data engineering and analytics, product management and design. Typically, in any given one of our clients, there's a typical, like, if there's a roadmap, there's a skills capacity gap or a capacity gap. So they either don't have the skill set or they don't have the headcount. And so we help fill that for our clients. Engagements can be as short as five, six months, as long as two years and counting as far as we've been around. On the managed services side, in the software development cycle, there's chunks that you might be able to partition out and they just need some inputs and outputs. So we've been able to set up primarily on the QA side, either device or application, building a team of QA engineers for a couple different clients. So fair to say a lot of technical sort of software kind of related work. Yeah, it's where we focus on a general technology stack, but we've been able to get to the niches. So as an example, we're working with an immersive reality company and they do a lot of their work in Unity and Unreal. So we've been able to find some game engine developers for them. It crosses the gamut and all the way up to something that's a little bit more commonplace. So like we've got one of our clients is a financial company and they needed a quote unquote website producer. So somebody to come and help build like various landing pages and things like that. And we were able to help them with that talent. So spans the gamut, stay on the technical side. It's what we're good at. It's what we do. Both me and my business partner have product backgrounds. And so that gives us a, a little bit of an edge in order to put together some really good teams. So this is my sort of bread and butter and professional services, although, you know, I'm on the government side, you're on the commercial. And then you had said you got started at what, two years ago, was that right? Two years ago. So my business partner actually bootstrapped this at the tail end of 2021. And then I joined him in 2022. So our full first operating year was 2022. And so last year was our second full year of business. And you guys were able to, you told me to double revenue last year. That's right. So we're in currently low seven figures. We doubled revenue from in year two from year one. Hopefully we can double it again this year. We'll see what happens. Bootstrap in a professional services business is, it's pretty easy to do that first bit, right? Where you have that contact and, you know, you might've worked at a company or something like that, but like to get it past that is a pretty tough business to be in as I'm sure you've learned, right? Totally. And I think just for added context, my business partner, he's been in professional services for 10 years. And so he definitely, because of his network and reputation, got us our first initial uh, continuing to get our clients. Whereas I came from the product side. So I've done a lot of the operations and delivery and I'm starting to also pull in some clients because as my reputation is shifting from product guy to professional services, software services, oh, Dylan can help put a team together for you. That's starting to come into the fold now too. So obviously 2022 must have been a pretty rough year in the tech space. Yes and no. Any incremental headcount or any incremental business activity for us was a massive win. And our overhead was so low that like, I'm not saying it was win after win. We definitely struggled. There was massive lulls and doubt and all those things that come along with entrepreneurship. That happened a lot in 22, but I would say even in 2023 was probably even more because I think 
the market was continuing to tank is keeping in mind everyone was like, okay, the recession's looming and all companies are tightening their belts. There was more layoffs. And so it was like a continuation of 2022. So I felt like for OnBench, you know, we were able to navigate and surf a good wave in 2022. And then in 2023, we just got some wins and managed not to lose them, which I think is a win in and of itself. But I felt it more last year. Uh, I felt more of the angst in technology. I felt it more in 23 versus 22. So tell me a little bit about, so who are you selling to usually like a CTO type or does it kind of vary across a lot of roles? No, you're, you're absolutely right. Our ideal person is a chief technology officer, VP of engineering, lead data person. Oftentimes our warm lead into a company is like the VP of product. Cause again, me and my partner speak product pretty well. And then it's like, do they have a good relationship with engineering? What is that? Can we get a warm lead in? But our typical buyer is like chief data officer, CTO, VP of engineering, that kind of person. And then as I'm learning, and I think I would love to learn from you too, it's, um, there's always the person who buys your service. And then there's the procurement person. There's like the paperwork that can be really intense depending on the scale of the company. And there's some companies that we're like, okay, we're too small to like satisfy a lot of these requirements. They have these huge master services agreements, right? That you got to try to like tons of questionnaires and security and compliance. And we're like, we're just a small business. Like we don't have a lot of the redundancies that they require often. But there's also a lot of large companies that we've been working with that we've been able to jump through the hoops. And it's been a really good relationship. And so they're coming to you, this data officer, whoever, because they're really looking for like a staff log kind of person and they don't want to like hire Deloitte or Accenture or something. Is that the deal? It really is contextual. And I think there's probably a couple of answers. One, the answer is it's all a little bit similar. Like there's commoditization in there, but I think we differentiate ourselves. I can tell you how and why, but I think from a client perspective, they've either had a longstanding relationship with one of the big companies and that's just who they go with. That's who they're comfortable with. If they're looking for a new partner, they're looking for potential specialists. And then there's like an answer of, okay, I might not know what I need, I like working with high touch account people because you could go to a specific shop that does SAP or they only do Snowflake data config or something like that. And great, you'll get the technical expertise and you're buying that. But if anything branches out or spills over or they need account escalation or some sort of handholding, you might not get that level of attention from that consulting. Similarly, from like a large organization, they have a bench to carry and they're going to tell you that they've got the right person for you. Where on bench is our operating model is a bit unique in that we work with uh, local teams on the ground and are able to really align with our clients. So we don't have the whole bench carrying aspect to it because we work with our partners and can recruit to the bench. And that helps. And so that makes us flexible. It aligns our incentives better. So the client might say, okay, look, I've got a roadmap that I've got enough headcount to do 75% of it. I need somebody in the next two weeks to come on for a six month project because this is like an interdependency I have in it. You could go do the work to go find that right person. You could go to the consultancy and pay the premium, or you could come to an on bench and where we're contingency based, really active. You're dealing with me, you're dealing with my business partner, we're in the weeds, and we can provide that kind of high touch, high touch experience that I think a lot of companies want. But you wouldn't necessarily manage the day to day of that person on the site that the client would. We usually embed them onto the team. That's how we're able to scale a little bit better too. And, and they would prefer that. They don't want to hire a manager or anything. Like they want this person just to come in, the remote hot desk kind of thing, sit down, here's all the stuff you need, start producing. And our talent know that. They walk in knowing that. And the expectations are aligned. They're onboarded like that. It's friendly. Like a lot of, like we've got long standing clients who are literally almost as long as I've been at OnBench, they've been with the client. It's almost like a full time thing, but this is how they like to work. It's simple the way we make it happen. We're good with managing the account. Talent is happy. So it's a win win win. It's very similar at GovCon. We do a lot of this where it's, we call it staff aug or CETA support, science, engineering, technical advisory. All these terms kind of blend into each other. So it's not these fine distinctions, but there are a lot of kind of staff aug kind of roles. And then there are ones where we're, you're responsible for the solution. So you've got a lot of management overhead in there as well. And it kind of blinds back and forth, but it's interesting to hear like 
you could have like a long term two plus year person, you know, working at a commercial client on the government side, like they just can't hire that person. So question is, why don't they hire someone for that role? Totally. And I think sometimes the economics don't work out. I mean, if they wanted to hire this person in the US, they would cost them two or three times as much like in comp. And then also with all the overhead that goes along with it. Whereas with us, we take care of it. So you're like an offshore interface for them in some ways, right? Depending on the role. To some degree. Well, like the reason why we don't say that is because our clients vary in what they need depending on anything. So we have worked to help wrangle bids. We have worked as product strategy consultants. We have worked as setting up managed services for quality assurance. So the fact that we're small allows us to have that flexibility and just being really client-centric about what you need. And I don't consider it like, we're not doing marketing or biz dev or any of that like crazy. We do software engineering, product work, design, and data. That's what we do. That's what we're set up to do. And so what flavor of that engagement, we keep a little bit more flexible just because sometimes our clients need different things. We've also done recruiting. So there was a, a biotech startup that we worked with last year and they needed a VP of engineering and we were happy to help because we worked with them on the team augmentation side as well. And they were like, look, we need the senior leadership and we're not finding it. And so we took a stab at it since our network is pretty good and our, our operations good. And we were able to find somebody for them. We just, again, try to like be a trusted partner or whatever they need from the product and software development side. That's professional services, baby. Be whatever they need you to be, right? Yeah, and I'm learning that as I go. <laughs> yeah, that's where you go from a product guy. You're not supposed to be everything for everyone, whatever they want you to be. You're supposed to be one thing, right? We're not trying to be everything either. I think like we're not advertising it. Like we, we definitely are reactive when it goes outside of our direct wheelhouse of of team augmentation. Like we're reactive to that piece. And then these people you recruit, like say it's like short-term gigs. These are people who are like prioritize. They want to have sort of like a lot of small gigs that run periods of time. Is that sort of like, how do you find those people that are open to that? We work with talent around the world. Americans, Europeans, LATAM, Pakistan, India. I would say the common trait is a lot of times in product and software development, it's normalized to work on contracts. Like it happens more frequently than you think. For example, when I was at in product at Hulu, there was a couple of engineers I worked with and I just thought they worked at Hulu. I had no idea that they were actually contracted from Mexico and they would just come up to like a yearly or every half year for one of the planning sessions that we have. I had no idea. I thought they just they were Hulu people. So it happens, I think, more frequently than we see. Like on an hourly wage, they get paid more than they would at a, as a W-2. And then it provides the company flexibility. So it does end up being a pretty cohesive and arrangement all around. From a personality type, it honestly ranges. I mean, it's people just, they like to experience different things. They don't like being tied down necessarily to the W-2. But also the culture of work is different. You know, and I can't really like pithily say all of the nuances, but an Argentinian versus a Brazilian versus a Mexican versus a Colombian, like they're going to have different attitudes toward work, how they think about it and traveling in, you know, in between the countries. And there's always something like that. Okay. So you guys get in, you know, you have, so I always say professional services is awesome for that first year because you usually you got some connections, right? So you you know, you get your first gigs doing that, but I'm like, how fast did like the network get tapped or has it been tapped? Like, is it, have you worked through it and had to go to like new tactics? I have gone through, I would say like seven or eight, what I would say business development iterations. I was really focused on delivery and operations 2022, because while you get a new account, is the business development side. You actually only make money when you deliver, right? You only make money when you operate really well. I was really focused on operating well. And so that was like 2022. In 2023, mid-ish 2023, I started to think about what business development looked like for me. And this was, again, like context, right? The market was not great. Everyone's hanging on to dry powder. There was not a lot of investment in human capital and product. There's layoffs all around. So it was a really bad time to be like testing ideas. So initially, I think I was probably quieter than I thought that I should be. And I started doing like more cold outreach because I thought 
maybe let me try this. It was terrible. It was a terrible idea. Complete. I, I quickly was like, look, the probabilities and the hit rate is terrible. Let's move it aside. So I started then doing more warm leads and then warm leads through through LinkedIn, my network. You know, like I went to a decently sized public state business school at IU. I have a decent network in technology. And so I just started kind of letting people know what I was doing, just catching up with people and like earnestly too, because like these are my friends and I, I felt weird about it. I think that was one hump that I personally had to get over was feeling inauthentic talking about business. If I didn't have this to talk about, I might not ever reach out to this person. So I actually just kind of was like, hey, I'm doing this. If it's not interesting to you, all good. I would love to catch up, see how you're doing. And I think that there's a personality type for that too. And I was kind of tapping into that version for me. So reaching out to people and then the old marketing 101, segment target and position, right? So I was just figuring out who I want would love to be in business with, building lists, and then kind of going through it. I have went through a few iterations and now I'm at a place where I think I'm comfortable with the sales process of getting a warm contact info. Like I'm okay asking for the warm lead, letting people know what I'm doing. If you're on LinkedIn, you know me through business school, like this shouldn't be a surprise that I'm trying to do business stuff. Like, right? Like it's, and I think it's fine. And most people who know me know that like, I don't do this a lot. I'm not, I'm just running a business now and it's a different, thing. So now just getting that warm intro in as pretty much the flavor. So I have lists, do the outreach, try to get a meeting, figure out if there's a need. And if there isn't at the time, cool, like we'll check in every once in a while. And if there is great, let's see what we can carve out. If we don't win it for whatever reason, goes back to great, we'll just check in every once in a while. And I keep it like that. And as I'm learning, it's volume and consistency. And and so I think and that is that's where I'm at. Right, 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 right. So cold doesn't work. Especially for what we do, especially for professional services. I think that needs to be noted. It's a volume game to some degree, but it's not that volume. We did like some, we hired some company that was doing like email. They're getting, they buy emails and go do emails and do that kind of cold outreach. And, and then the third email would be funny and try to get to, and it did, it did like nothing. I mean, it was just such a waste of time. So. Yeah. And I think I told you at the time I had known a guy, he was from a pretty successful consulting company, very, you know, similar to yours, maybe a little bit more solution oriented, a little bit less people. But what they would do is because they would have, you know, a lot more W2s, right? So every W2 that came in, part of condition of employment was downloading their LinkedIn database. And so they, they had them in a big database. They would look at, you know, they would profile, hey, the top X, because they had, they were an office based system, right? So they'd be like, all right, within X, well, I mean, like Dallas, like, like every headquarters in the world is there. So you want a company that's over X amount of millions in revenue because they would hire for consultants, right? And then anybody who had a connection to anyone there that they wanted to get into, even if it was like, I know the receptionist, it was like, we don't care. The receptionist has a boss. We'll talk to their boss. And then their boss has a boss. And we'll just work our way up. So what I realized, it was just this like massive networking tree that they would go through. And they had to have people who basically that's all they did was work that network. So I assume you found that this is a very time-consuming activity. Yeah, it is. I mean, I was just like in the past couple of days, I'm not even done. I was just going back through who I contacted last quarter of like, people and just reaching back out, setting up some calls and like, and these things take time. Everyone's got a to-do list and their own things. So you can't take anything too personally. Before I started, before I went to business school, I was in the film business. And on, when I was on the creative development side, it was all networking. This is it. It just, it's just really funny that pre like the basic of the first thing I did out of undergrad, I'm back to doing, doing it again. And I find a lot of comfort in that in that like there is no secret sauce and it's just like being there being authentic don't be a schmoozy dick and just this is who i am happy to if we're not a fit awesome great if i could ever help be helpful on any level and we have referred our own clients to other services that we were not a good fit for like it happens and like we just really and like and that's who we are we were work hard be nice be kind and like try to take that in it's just now i'm doing it on the on the volume side and reach out to my network and it takes a lot of time. Would you say that's responsible for the doubling of revenue? Or is this like something that you're investing in now to see whether it pays off? 
again, I started officially doing my real outreach like mid-ish last year. And from what I understand, like a long-term business belt in a professional services, it can take like a year for any of these things to bear any fruit. And I think that's even a little thumb in the air. It could be two years, it could be five years, it could be whatever. It's really about just staying top of mind and just like it's repetition, right? How does trust get built? Repetition, credibility, they can see you doing the work and that you're still operating, you're growing, all those things. So it's something I would say that I've been investing in. The revenue growth is attributed, I think most of it, if not all of it, I'd have to look depending on when clients came in, but it pretty much is all account expansion. So it was our current clients happy with what we're doing, knowing that we can be trusted and to deliver really great people and be really great people to work with and coming back to us with like, hey, we actually need this and this. And that is what doubled our revenue. That was my guess. That, if you had asked me, I would have said most of it probably is going to result from that account expansion because that's the way it works, right? I'm happy. I would much, like, like if I had to pick, right? Like I would rather just stick with the 10 clients we have. We're great partners to you. I don't like, that's fine. I want to add in some more accounts into the fold. And you know this too, we don't need a ton of accounts to be pretty successful at what we're doing. I would rather have, and I think this is a choice you can make as a small business owner, is you can choose to have a smaller list of clients that you love to work with and everybody's happy and, and you grow the business. You could grow it to however big you want, but with that comes the trade-off of overhead, not being on the ground the way you want to, maybe not having the personal relationship that you want to. It all comes as a trade-off. We're well below our next like plateau of needing to add any significant overhead. But I think like if me and my partner had a choice, we would just rather have a few awesome clients and and build. I think that again, agree account expansion is a way to go. You always need to have that new account process underway. It's not gonna yield a major new account every month, right? But there are going to be things that happen on accounts. Like you could have a long-term thing and the CEO gets fired and they clean out an entire department. Totally. And for us, the project ends and they're like, hey, thanks. Exactly. I always found that frustrating trying to balance those two because it's so, you're spending so much time developing the new accounts and they just, it just takes forever. And you're, you get a lot more like quick results from reinvesting in where you are. So. But it does, like in professional services, I think you always have to be doing both. And the question I would have is sort of like, if you benchmark yourself a little bit against some of the other people coming in, take a look at, are their materials better? Like, do they have videos with their clients, testimonials and case studies? And like, is that, can that turn the dial at all for you? Or like the other thing I really see is successful is like, if you hit on something that's hot at a client, like you're on some AI thing or whatever, then like that can become the lever to like get in somewhere else because everyone's kind of looking for that thing, right? And that becomes like this huge door opener. We haven't found that. I'm wondering, like, in order to find that thing, that lever, do you spend time like thinking about, like, how does, how do you find that thing? Because I, it seems to me like, it either slaps you in the face, in which case it's so painfully obvious, it's probably hyper competitive, or you have to do a little work to find the inside. I think that and maybe that's just like an old behavior from product of like what you say and what you show isn't the thing that's actually driving the need, it's a symptom of the need. So I'm wondering, like, how do you find that thing that becomes the lever? I think this is what it's all about, right? So there's no hundred percent answer it's like you're spraying and praying most of the time and when you start figuring it out then you grow really quick and then you hit another plateau and you figure out the next thing but that figuring out i feel like you have to break that time apart to actually look at the data think about it reflect right i think that that's where a lot of business owners may get trip up at least what's where i do there's not enough time to like take out that time like i'm i'm, I'm delivering i'm operating i'm that I'm selling and I'm doing this. I don't have time. Like, it's hard to break up the time to just go, what have we done? Like, let's take a look at the projects that we've done. Let's take a look. Like, you know, it's almost hard to do that to some degree. You're leading me right where I wanted to go. So I agree. This is what's hard, right? This is what I call growing my company. I started my company too. We did a million in our first year and we got up to like three to four by year five. And then the whole thing just, we started losing work. We weren't running the place, you know. I had the first really bad black hole, right? And so 
quite frankly, we got lucky to go up to four that quickly, right? It was just some luck, but we hit it like a freaking freight train and like bounce back. And, um, I think that this is the issue, right? You got to figure out what it is. So like, what can you do? Well, you try a bunch of stuff, but you've got to be really good at firing consultants and marketing people that you try to do stuff with. I think that there's a lot of really good things you can get out of benchmarking, right? So try to, you know, the other thing is to ask the people who are your customers, like why they hired people for various reasons, you know, that kind of thing. But I do think this is one of those things where you like another lever. I don't know if you've considered, you know, we've talked about it, obviously, and you've been to Main Street Summit is like, that's why people buy because they've at least figured out some of these levers to get to the next level, depending on what you buy. That's why you don't want to buy a 500 K business, right? You want to buy a $5 million business that kind of figured out a couple of those levers. So I'd be curious of you and Nina, and it's, and it's a tougher field in professional services or it's relationship based. It's like, what are you buying when you buy it? Could you buy a master services agreement? Could you buy that? You know, I don't know. So have you and your partner talked about that option at all? No, we haven't considered it. We are fully bootstrapped and probably maybe overly cash conservative. And it's not that we have said no, it just hasn't been a question. I think like given the market dynamic and how suppressed I think this space has been in general in the past couple of years, I want to give it a fair shot before we try something that different. It's not an ego thing. It's that I think that we can get a little bit further, a little bit deeper with our clients. I think we can add a few more clients. And I want to see where that takes us. Because I think sometimes, I think we can still hit the bullseye with the current gun we have. I don't want to bring in a bazooka and blow it up. Because then, man, the cost of being wrong. Because what if we're wrong about our certain thesis, the way we operate, our account management model, our operating model? Now I've got another company here with people probably on the bench that have their own culture. I've got to worry about integration. So now my focus is on this and not on what we were set out to do, which is solve client problems with really great talent. And so I think it detracts me. And right now I feel like I've just hit my stride. I don't necessarily think it's the right decision, but it is a way of not chewing glass for two more years, figuring out what the growth levers are, right? And um, one thing I'd offer though, is I do think it's something good to look at because you learn a lot about other companies and what makes them good or not. You don't even, you don't have to buy anything, right? You just look at them, right? Yeah, just get the perspective. Right. And you're seeing what drives their growth, how their growth is structured. You know, you see what their gross margin is. You see what, you know, so. And increasingly, I think it becomes less of a bazooka as you grow. Hey, buying a $5 million company when you're $5 million isn't a bazooka anymore. Now it's a, it's a rifle. I agree with you. Like, if we get to five, six, and there's another $5 million business that's available, like, why wouldn't we consider that? Right now, we're not there. But, like, I think, like, once we hit that mark and we're actually stalling a little bit, I think it'd be worth considering as long as we're also, to your point, doing the work of figuring out why we're stalling. Because did we go after the wrong market? Is that market who we thought were underserved actually being, is there some sort of equilibrium that hit with their technical talent? Are we not doing active account management? Are we not doing the right kind of business development? Like as long as we're trying to identify why we stalled and then the formula is something like, hey, actually we're doing everything we can. It's just growth in this area would take X years and that's where we're focused on. Then it sounds like, okay, great. Well, there's a company over here that's been doing it. Maybe we should just go acquire them and just jumpstart our way in. Totally see that as a plausible, very realistic scenario. I think you're smart to do it that way. I mean, I think you're probably the best potential acquirer rather than some guy coming out of business school who doesn't know shit about an industry, like going in and buying a company, right? So like in some ways, you're almost like an ideal acquirer. A woman I know here had like a million, $2 million GovCon company, and then she went and bought like a $5 million one and just like really accelerated her growth. Now she's like 20. She was able to integrate it and continue to scale it? Well, because essentially... She was not integrating cultures. She was basically bringing her company. She was like, oh, whatever you guys are doing, I want to do that. Exactly. She, she's going into their culture and very consciously because she liked the way it was set up and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, so one thing I would advise is definitely taking a look at acquisitions just from a learning perspective, like see the companies, see how they grow. So I would definitely, you know, again, I hear you. It's all time. It's difficult. 
And then I think what I wasted so much time on is all these different marketing ways, ways of trying to get work. And it just like I cycled through 50 of them, I feel like. And like none of them worked. I am trying one and you can, I, I, I hear you and I know you're going to be like, Dylan, you should do this. It is an offshore. So it's technically inside sales or direct sales. We are treating it as like a marketing channel to some degree because what we were hiring an offshore sales guy to basically do dial for dollars, but it's really like LinkedIn messaging, networking. They'll be representing on bench and there, what I'm going to be setting them up to do is going after the industries that I want to get into, but I have zero network into and like they're right for it. And so get me one good meeting and give me a call, like one good account to close. It kind of pays for itself, to be honest. And so my downsides kind of capped and I'm willing to try it for a little bit to see if it works. Right. And so this is my thing. It's like, I think it's unlikely to work, right? You, are, you know, my bias on stuff like that. But I don't say don't do it because I do think there are things that work sometimes and you got to try them, but you got to be ruthless about getting rid of it when it's very clear it's not going to happen. Right. So like, that's the trap is you drain your cash, you drain your time. Like you said, you just got so many things to do and so little base to do it on that you got to be kind of ruthless with what you're trying. And this is, I, you know, again, I went through this. I did all the, I did this whole exercise on problems we solve and we did this whole marketing campaign and we did this and we did that, you know, and like in the end, like what did it? It was some combo of luck, account expansion, like our clients where we we're doing good work, got more money, bam. Right. And then, um, for me, it was getting, as I kind of got Bigger, got toward that mid seven figures market. It was getting rid of incompetent people in leadership and getting in some people who could really build the back office and do all this stuff. So that's probably not quite where your problem is yet. And so some of it was just being existing, having the money drop. And I did all this marketing. I don't think it did anything. One of my favorite maxims is activity breeds serendipity. You know, luck is the function of surface tension, like how much. Can you cover? And I don't know, like you obviously got incremental accounts during that time. Now, whether it was a actual marketing thing that did it, but maybe it refined your own thinking and how you talked about it when you were doing direct engagement toward them. Maybe. I mean, really what happened in my world was like, we had clients, we worked in this thing, like public safety communications programs for the government. And then like that got big because of, oh, like it turned into this broadband issue, right? Back in like mid 2010s. And then public safety broadband became broadband for America, right? And so that led into these massive like grant programs and infrastructure programs to build out. And we just followed that. So like literally it was like, I was literally, I mean, yes, we did good proposals and we had done the work of like knowing all the clients around that. So we did the account expansion kind of stuff, but like until the money dropped, I don't think it was us. So like, I actually, when I look back on it, I haven't run this scenario a hundred thousand times. I've run it once. So take it for what it's worth. But for me, it was luck being there, doing good work, obviously, and professional services, you got to do it. Doing that, yes, I'm going to go try to meet the person who's adjacent to this office who could do something that helped. So we networked in that community, but it was really luck and it was getting better people. But as we grew and understanding, like a big thing for me was as we grew, then how do I replace me talking to those clients every day? And I hired a lot of people that couldn't do that and had to fly, go through like that. Right. So that was a big barrier, but it was really just that luck. And I'm sitting here like eight years later being like, I should have just bought a $5 million company and I would have gone through that so much faster. So anyway, that's where my, that's where my bias comes from. And maybe I would have screwed that up, you know? So I can't say maybe I would have bankrupted myself. This podcast might be about different things. It might be about like how to integrate a company because that's really, that's an enormous amount of risk too that you're taking on by doing that. Of course. And I, I don't want to be one note on it. I don't think that's what you should do, but it's just, it's just to this, like growing a small company is hard and there's a lot of people out there telling you different ways to do it. And I just never found anybody that knew what they were talking about. To scale my learning up the professional services curve, I reached out to guys like you. I've reached out to people who are 10, 20, 30 years ahead of me in the space. That was the only way I knew how to do it. And so I got a few good learnings from these people. And what else did you hear? I'm curious. 
everybody started it the same way. I don't think that they put the one year time frame on it the way you did, but they were like, look, go do your pitch, find your friendlies, find the warm leads. And you just keep doing that until you get enough revenue to hire a business development person. You know, one piece of advice I heard was hire your next BD guy a little bit before you think you're ready because, man, I wish I had done that earlier. Let them hit the ground running a little bit more. I'm going to push back on that that one hardcore. Again, it, it's some people have said it. And then I've also heard the other piece is like, hey, delay it. You should always be running sales and 50% of your time should always be committed to growing the accounts, which is where I'm at now. More than 50% for sure. But I think like just the process of the zoom in, zoom out of your business strategy, what you're offering, how you talk about it, and then putting in the time and consistency. Like... It's a simple business. I think where the nuances come out are in the specific interactions. Like there's stuff that I have already got war stories on several things that have happened from honestly like mental health issues to like crazy projects, like people being shady. We've had to fire full on companies that we don't want to do business with. It's already been intense and you can't really plan for that. I think it's just like, how do you... Stay level-headed, make sure you're ingesting good reading. Like, honestly, make sure that's the stuff that's circling your head. Because when shit hits the fan, how do you step back and think about it long-term? Think about what the short-term fire is, structure the problem, communicate effectively, and then start to execute. I think that's, to me, where... And, and by the way, that's what's been probably the most gratifying thing over the last couple of years is I love not working for anybody. I love working for myself and seeing business grow. And using what I think I developed a lot of skills over the, my career and seeing them all kind of come into play. So I know this podcast isn't about convincing people to be small business owners, but like I would say that if you feel like if you're at a job that's not using more than 60, 70 percent of what you have to offer, consider running your own business because it will probably use 110 percent of what you've got to offer. <laughs> But it will force you to look at every aspect of yourself and not always in good ways, right? So like, it'll force you to be like, it'll challenge your mental health, right? Am I any good at these kind of things? Like, it will make you look in the mirror and like face yourself. There's no one else to blame, right? Except for yourself. And that's why you have a partner, so you can blame them, right? <laughs> that's exactly right. Hey, and I have got a good division of labor and like last quarter, and it took a couple of iterations. I'm glad I put in the work, but like I was able to kind of boil down our 2024 operating plan in about a couple of pages. And we just did that this year and we've got what we're doing, like what area we're investing our time, who owns it, what metric is it going by? And then every quarter or probably every month, we're going to take a look and see where we're at. And that was one learning for me personally is I think 2023, we did like an our own offsite and I had these business development goals. And by like week two of January, it was all blown. Like this account fell apart. This new account came in. We we're like, it was like, well, I don't know how to play this. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, I totally hear you. It's exactly what happens at your stage. And like, I just wanted to go back real quick on the sales guy thing because I want to make sure that people understand that's, I really believe in professional services that the people running the business have to sell. Because when you're small, because you're the only talented person who's willing to take the salary cut to like be at the company that way. A lot of other people, the really talented salespeople that can do everything, they make $2 million a year and work for Oracle. They're not going to work for a, a small upstart company. And you're effectively like a better salesperson than your company deserves when you start out. Because you're like the high-powered guy who would have been at Oracle, but is actually working in this company because you want to work for yourself and build something. So obviously you're the best person to sell. And no one else, you're not going to be able to hire anybody capable of doing it until you get past that five up to 10 million phase. Then you have to get somebody else to sell. Or, you know, you can choose to go the partner model and be like, this is going to be a company of helpers around me. And it's going to be about Dylan and your partner. That's totally acceptable. And you can make a lot of money that way, but you don't have an asset and you're not going to be able to scale it to the next level, except by hiring, bringing in new partners. So I wanted to make sure people understand that that my ban on a salesperson is not throughout the cycle of the company. It's only at the beginning. And by the way, I think the advice that I was given was not like a hard, fast rule that you should do it like right away. It was more like doubling your throughput with a great sales guy at some point in early-ish in your lifespan of the company. This probably could possibly help because 
Otherwise, uh, the level of stress that business owner, especially if it's only one person, and this is that person, the person I'm thinking about, like it was only him. I think he just felt like that weight. And so getting a highly compensated biz dev person was a good move for him. Before you ever do that, we'll do another podcast and we'll just talk about my experience trying to set, hire salespeople. If you're willing to have me back. I called the job uh, being Darth Vader's admiral. It's a good job, but you're probably going to get killed in the next year. So I think I fired about four salespeople in four years. So, so definitely there's stars there. There's stars there. Now I have a great sales guy. Now that we're bigger, it's a lot easier to attract that person who, like now I'm able to go to somebody who's like running one account in a big company and they want to run their own show across all the accounts. I can attract that person. But before, there's just no way, right? Where do you want to take on bench two? Like, what's your guy's goal? I think that getting past 15 mil ARR contract revenue per year would be like amazing. And then like, however high we can take it without, I think that there is probably some natural growth limits for us in that, like what I said was true. Like, we want to work with a smaller clientele doing really great work and build, you know, so I'd rather stay small if it meant like I get my freedom, raising my kid, you know, being my wife running a great business. Like I would rather not have that pressure of the overhead and all the infrastructure that comes along with enormous amounts of scale. I reserve the right to change my mind, but that is definitely where I'm thinking. Like, cause I, I, I'm having fun with what we're doing. You'll definitely change your mind and it's totally fine, right? I was in my thirties and I had kids and it was a lot easier to just kind of do the work and we, we were doing well and I was learning and but like, then I got to a point where I was like, I need to find a way to sell this thing or make it into something that operates without me being, I want it to be saleable in the sense that it doesn't depend on me, whether I sell it or not. And, and I want it to scale. And that came later, right? I always went back and forth, but then there was a point at which it was like, this is not going to be worth me doing anymore unless I take it this direction. And I think that's totally cool. No one needs to come out with a mission hundred percent big. I think that's probably it. Like, you know, on bench is on a good trajectory. We're having fun. We love our clients. We like who, you know, our partners are great. And let's just keep growing. I think a lot of people end up thinking about what, what do you want to be as opposed to what do you want to do? And right now, I think I'm doing what I want. And so I'm happy with that. It's a beautiful thing. Just don't go to a lot of more business conferences because then you'll see all these other people and be like, oh, I actually want to do that. Right. So keep the blinders on if you're happy. I'll try. There's some real truth to that. I think it's just being able to say, yeah, this is what I want to do. And, you know, if I go to a business conference here and there, hopefully I meet some good people, get some good food, and then be happy with what it is. So if you're talking to some guy, he's at tech company, thinking about starting his own company, what's your recommendation for you three years ago? I would say if, the, if it's something that you've consistently been thinking about and have potentially tried, I would say continue to do so and to probably do it beside of your day job until build on the side. I think burning the boat is only a good thing if you've really packed for the journey and you need to know what you're getting yourself into. And if you're going into services, to your point, like have those few clients first in hand, make sure that there's a contract in place, a long-term engagement, and then go. And then you'll have to make it up as you go along. If it's a product-based company, then I think building that MVP and starting to roll it out slowly on the side of your day job is 100% possible, especially with today's cheaper engineers, low-code, AI, like all of this is absolutely in your favor if you're building a product company. Depends on what time intensive. Don't try to do both, for sure. I like breaking things into some level of a formula. So like, if you have an interest in something and you're like, okay, I know I have the time, I know I have the knowledge, I know I have the execution, but I'm not getting that result, break that down into some sort of first principles of like, okay, well, do I have enough knowledge? Like really, like, and I think that's what I've been doing for my sales process. Zooming in, zooming out, like putting it into practice and zooming out and going, is this what, am I getting the output that I want? And then zooming back in. Because then you'll be able to see if your product or service or business or whatever it is, is actually going to be able to fund the rewards. I think the other thing I would say for anybody is control your burn rate. What do you need to live on? Because you might find that you don't need as much as you thought you needed. If you're married or have a kids, like that conversation gets a little bit broader and different, but it's just, it's the same on principle. Like, okay, well, what do we need to survive month to month? What am I bringing in now? And then what will I need to bring in in order for them to make this real? And then do the switch over whenever you hit certain levels. And I think you did something smart, have a wife that works and live in Dallas. Don't live in San Francisco. Well, we just moved, so thankfully, uh, that was, uh, yeah, I mean, moving to a lower cost of living area is absolutely part of the plan for my family, you know, like, 
we're doing fine. Yeah, exactly. Well, what we're going to do on the pod, um, Dylan, is we're talking to some small companies and some midsize and then some of the like big X, you know, gurus, but particularly on the companies that are really growing, developing like you, we want to check in every like six to 12 months and like see how the efforts are going. Like, what did you learn from, you know, when we talk to now? So I think it's really cool for people to see that happening. Like, hey, I did that cold calling thing. That that sucked. I expect to hear that, but I won't be pleasantly surprised. And then, you know, so hopefully we can get you out in a few months, see how things are going. A hundred percent. Doing this in January is an easy timing to remember because at worst, you and I can talk every January and see what happens. That's right. That's awesome. Well, thanks for being on the pod, Dylan. And good luck with I'm done. It just sounds like it's going awesome. My pleasure, Alan. Thanks for putting out great content and, and doing this pod. And I think your your voice in the landscape of operators for small business is sorely needed. So I appreciate it. Your content resonates with me. I'm glad you're doing this. Face flattery will always work, Alan. So I appreciate that. All right, man. See you. You've been listening to the Small Business Mentor Podcast, brought to you by Alan Pence. For more insights on how to navigate your business through its black holes, visit at APENCE on X. Don't forget to search for Small Business Mentor in your podcast app to subscribe. Thank you for joining us and here's to your next leap in business growth.